Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of My Racing Life on Racing TV. Today's guest is perhaps one of the most famous sporting faces in the country. He is one of the finest snooker players uh, in Britain. He won the World Championship back in 1991 at the Crucible. He was also the captain on the BBC's iconic quiz show, A Question of Sport, for a number of years. He was also part of the BBC's presenting team for a number of years as well. I can call him a colleague and a friend. It's a very warm welcome to John Parrott. JP, how are you? I'm absolutely great, Rishi, and delighted to be speaking to you. You've been a good mate for a long time, and uh, you're doing a great job there on Racing TV. And looking forward to talking rubbish about some of the horses that I've, uh, I've known over the years. Well, the one thing we often did when we spoke uh, at snooker events over the years was uh, distract ourselves from what was going on on the base to talk about racing. Um, <laughs> which we got told off for occasionally. Um, but when did, when did your love of racing first begin? My father took me very early. I, I, obviously, I'm not too far from Haydock and Chester and uh, Bangor on Dee. And he took me when I was about 10 years of age and I was immediately hooked. Absolutely loved everything about it. He was more um, interested in the flat. I was definitely and, and always have been a jumper. You know, I loved the, I loved the jumping. Um, but the first sort of recollection would be the 1978 Guineas where I'd put up a winner to him of the Guineas, Enstone Spark, trained by Barry Hills, and he'd punted it at 33 to 1 it won, and um, I think it returned about 28 or something, and that was the start of it really. We, uh, we ended up going on holiday with the rewards, and after that I was seriously hooked. And it's a great way of life, obviously, being able to follow horse racing. And one of the things I often uh, was intrigued by was the fact that you used to go racing quite a lot, just as a punter, uh, to, to a lot of local small, small level tracks, the, the grassroots. Why, why that? Because I just love the day out there. I mean, it, it's often said to me, I, mean, I, lo I do like flat racing, of course I do. It's, um, it, it, it's just that the jumps does something for. I mean, if there's a, a really good day's flat racing or an average day's jump, I'm a uh, jumps day. I'm, I'm going to Sedgefield and Bangor on D. It's just that I absolutely. I mean, it's in my blood to be in love with the jump racing. But I've always done it. Even at tournaments, I'd have, I'd give myself a day off if I won a, you know, if I won a match and then I wasn't playing for two or three days, I'd, I'd nip off to a meeting somewhere and go and watch it because it takes your mind away from what you were doing and um, just the pure love of the sport, really. Pure love of sport in, in general. Obviously, snooker took up a, a huge amount of your time as a, as a child and then, and then growing up. Well, what other sports were you interested in? Because obviously, you're, you're also very good at golf as well as uh, a lover of horse racing. So what was your sporting mm -hmm. uh, experience like as a child? Uh, fantastic. My father was, um, was a very good left back, played for Liverpool schoolboys and was signed up by one of the local teams there. And he, he was very sporty, so he took me to do everything. I was... I, was, I, I never lacked for, for, for the love or the interest from my father. He took me to do everything. I did table tennis, cricket, swimming, uh, obviously football, golf, everything you can think of. He said, come on, fancy a crack at this. And then, of course, with the crown green bowling. Uh, and then at the last one I came to was my snooker. But my father was absolutely sport mad, which is probably where I get it from. So I, I was always immersed in it. I, I still love my golf, love my racing. Um, obviously Everton Football Club we'd like to see him win a trophy just so I could take my son to Wembley and see us win something but it might be a while but it's, um, it's just purely I don't know what I'd do in my life without sport How did you end up an Evertonian? He went my father went years and years ago and uh, he went to see Everton play one day and unbelievably they hammered Liverpool passing the ball around the place it's, it probably hasn't happened since but um, he said right I'm going over there I'm going to watch the School of Science so he went to Goodison and you know, I'm, I'm a blue, my son's a blue, and that's the way it is. And the world of snooker, obviously, John, I mentioned you won the World Championship uh, back in 1991, uh, what, top player for, for so many years. But also, I guess, you did you share any racing experience, racing interest with other snooker players during your time as a top, top professional in this sport? Well, there's, there's plenty of others who like it, obviously. Uh, um, J, JV, I'll probably speak to more on the super circuit about anyone. John Berger was a very good judge. Um, he was the one who was telling me, and probably you as well, about one for <laughs> Arthur winning the Grand National yeah. for as long as you can remember. But John's a very good judge. Of, he knows what he's been watching. Um, he goes right back to the days of, of Mill House. I think that was his favourite, he said to me, over the jumps, but uh, a bit before my time. But he's absolutely immersed in it. So when we're there, it's me and JV. But we try not to do it on air too much, Rishi, because we do get told off. <laughs> Uh, I'm really intrigued by your, your list of seven horses, and we'll, we'll obviously get to them uh, in just a second. But what sort of criteria do you think were the things that helped you decide in the horses that you selected? Because I imagine, in your experience, you would have seen so many horses that would have moved you and, and touched you emotionally in so many ways. 
Well, the first thing to do was just I had to take away the flat horses because obviously my love is jumps. So they were, they were predominantly, well, nearly all of them are jumps except for the, the last horse, really, who's more dual purpose, but just I, I fell in love with him. But basically good, strong stamper horses, uh, places where I've been and seen them run, Aintree comes quite prominent uh, prominent in that because obviously my local track and I'd have a day off from practicing because I was doing five, six, seven hours practice every day. So to have a day off was a big thing, but I used to nip off and go to Aintree for these meetings. So a few of my selections of, of, of horses that have run at Aintree, but just, just to see a proper quality horse in the case of chasers, ones that can really jump and hurdle as ones that, you know, used to take the top bar off, just, just ping over the top bar and get away. And the uh, horses that you just looked at and went, hmm, that's a proper animal. Yeah, it's funny because you often talk to other people who uh, have been involved in another sport and have shown a passion for racing uh, that perhaps doesn't quite doesn't quite equate to the passion in their real sport, like uh, your snooker, for example. But from the from the time that we met and we started talking about racing, I sometimes found that that's the only thing you wanted to talk about. So in terms of the things that you love, if if you were able to explain to people at home about your love of racing and how you would manage your, your days, for example, when you were working or playing, uh, and how much racing would play a part in your everyday life? Well, early on, obviously, my, my snooker was the big thing. So I, I was doing those hours I mentioned. But the weekend come, I always made sure I worked really hard Monday to Friday so that Saturday could be off to watch either Everton or the sport or anything. But I'd have, the, I'd have either the sport in life in the, moment as, uh, in the morning as it was or the racing post when it started. And uh, I'd have a good breakfast in the morning, go to my local village and, and sit there and read it cover to cover. Uh, I'd have a fair old idea what I wanted to back for the day. And, and there was nothing better than sitting there, certainly in the winter, in, in the lounge with the curtains closed and in control of the remote <laughs> and flicking from channel to channel watching some of the best equine talent you want to watch. I mean, to me, that is an absolute proper afternoon, just sitting there and watching a really top-class jumps meeting, whether it be at the Tingle Creek or the Hennessy, whatever, is a really good afternoon. I, I, don't, I, I don't want to be anywhere else when that's on. Yeah, well, you then ended up uh, being, the pe being one of the people that people sat at home and watched on a Saturday afternoon at the races. Uh, but we're going to kick off with uh, John's first horse, uh, and we're going back to 1985, and as John mentioned, we're going back to a race course that he knows well, Aintree. That was big. The definite advantage there from Tom's Little Al, half free and wayward lad making ground as they come down to the final ditch now. Earl's Brig, half free, Tom's Little Al getting back into the picture, wayward lad over the far side, and old man Roll Bond coming into the picture too, as they come down now towards the second last. Earl's Brig being pressed by half free, wayward lad on the far side, Roll Bond right up with them, and they're racing now towards the last in a wide open race. Wayward lad over on the far side, half free on the near side, Earl's Brig, then Royal Bond. On the far side is Wayward Lad on the near side. It's half free. Wayward Lad landing in the lead then from half free and Earl's Brig and racing into the closing stages. It's Wayward Lad from half free. Wayward Lad from half free and Earl's Brig as they race up towards the line. Wayward Lad is going to win the Whitbread Gold Label Cup chase as they come to the line. Wayward Lad is the winner. Second is Earl's Brig. Third, half free. And fourth, Royal Bond. Then Coombs Ditch and the longtime leader, Tom's Little Al. That was Wayward Lad, uh, one of the best jumpers of a fence, I think, that uh, we've ever seen. Uh, you touched on it in the lead up to looking at this first horse, uh, John. You loved horses that jumped brilliantly. Yeah, there was never anyone more athletic. I mean, I fell in love with him first time in the paddock walking around a haydock. I mean, the most beautiful dark bay, almost black. And when you saw him jump a fence, he was athletic. I mean, the, the thing from that rerun there was. John Franken riding him in 85 at the last... I mean, how's he come up for him at the last fence there? Absolutely fantastic. But, he, you know, he had 55 runs in his career. He unseated his rider twice. He never actually fell in a race. A phenomenal jumper. Um, for me, the best horse never to win a Gold Cup. I mean, he just couldn't get the last couple of hundred yards up that hill, no matter how he tried. I mean, the year of Dawn run beat him, uh, you know, she, she just stayed on up the hill and he just couldn't get the trip. But three mile left-handed on a flat track i mean i'm saying that he won three king george's going right-handed but it was it wasn't really in, until he was in the straight he got himself organized there i, I always thought left-handed three mile and certainly a track with stiff fences he took some beating i mean he won two charlie halls he won two peterboroughs he won three king george's and of course that betfair bowl it is now that that yeah. race there that he won he won two of those as well and, and when he had his optimum conditions he was just fantastic to watch and still the best jumper of a fence i've seen 
How many times would you have seen him live then? Oh, uh, at least a handful. Um, obviously, still what I'm saying about playing snooker at the time, it wouldn't have been much more than that. But whenever he was local at Haydock or he was there, um, I saw him win a couple. And of course, the thing with him as well is at 12 years of age, his final race yeah. was in that Betfair Bowl again. It's called the, you know, the Whitbread Gold Cup then. But yeah. his final race at 12 and he won it again. And then he was retired immediately after that. And uh, to be honest with you, to be that hardy, to have 55 races, win 28 of them, 16 different tracks. I mean, what a racehorse that was. He'd give everybody a bit of fun. How painful was it watching when he led over the last in the Gold Cup before, as you say, Dawn Run just outstayed him? A lot more painful when you have a load of betting slips that thick <laughs> and you've been backing him each way all winter. Oh. <laughs> uh. Are you right? You say there are some horses he that just he just couldn't get. He just couldn't get the trip. He c he couldn't get the trip. But I think a lot of a lot of people who rode him, uh, Graham Bradley or uh, Robert Earnshaw or uh, indeed um, John Franken, said that that speed, his best two and a half to three miles, was his absolute best. You also point out that he was probably better going left-handed than right-handed. Yet he had the most extraordinary record in the King George before Desi and Corto came along. Yeah. Yeah. But you can watch a couple of those races and he's on his ear coming round the turn and some of them. I mean, John Franken won on him one year there and he's never going a yard. You can see that on the far side he's not really enjoying it. It's mm. not till he gets to the straights and he, he gets him straightened up that his, his class and his talent kicks in. So I think he won there despite them. I think if it had been the other way around, left hand and more gallop, I think more galloping track was a thing. Something with a long straight in which he could look at. I mean, mm. he just used to be pretty nigh unbeatable over those trips. And there's something wonderful as a, as a race goer, as a racing fan, watching a horse jump with the precision and the accuracy of a horse like Wayward Lad, I'm guessing for you. Yeah, and it, it's, much, it, it, it's much forgotten. I'm not saying that there aren't people who can train racehorses to jump. Of course they are. But when you see one who can jump properly uh, it, in whatever discipline, whether it's chases or hurdles, it's a massive advantage. I mean, you know, make a stand for Martin Pipe. I mean, you ever seen any yeah. hurdler or Beauvoir Dare who flicks over the top bar of his hurdles? I mean, to see something that actually do it and do it properly and keep making ground up. And that's what he did. I mean, he turned two or three lengths behind coming into a fence to be in a length in front because he jumped so well. And it's a, it's a massive advantage if you can jump. You're obviously a Merseyside man, John. How important a race course has Aintree been for your love of the sport? Uh, massively so, Rishi, and I think it's unbelievable. If you, it, I went there, as I say, I went there about 10, uh, 10 years ago, so I would have been 1974, 75. It is unrecognisable from what it was then. They've done a brilliant, brilliant job with it. The track is superb. I still don't think they use it enough. I'd love to see another couple of meetings there. They'll probably won't thank me for saying that because I don't want to save the ground all the time but I, the people of Liverpool love that track and mm. the first year they put that meeting on in November 11,000 people turned up in the pouring down rain that just told them how much they liked the racing so it's a brilliant track I just wish they'd use it a bit more <laughs> uh, just go indeed just going back to, to Wayward Lad though and and some of the characters that were involved with him. Uh, he was trained at various times by, by the Dickinson family as well, part of the, the, the famous five for, for Michael. Uh, it was quite poignant, I, I think, at the end of his career, after he won in 1987, that at least he ended up spending his retirement with Michael in, in, in America. Yeah, and one of the owners was very kindly, uh, I think they paid 42000 for him. There was a massive cheer I think Monica Dickinson was in tears when she, she actually the, the final bid was accepted and he was, he was sent away quite rightly for a, a retirement. I think one of the owners was trying to get him to go hunt and chase or something, which at the end of a career like mm. that, he didn't really deserve. So it was fantastic. They had a great retirement after it. And uh, he went out, he started off winning a, a Leicester Novice Hurdle Division 2 and then finished winning the Betfair for the, for the last race of his career and, and what a career it was. How often did you go to, when you were a snooker player, how often did you go to that, uh, the Grand National entry meeting at that sort of time of the year? Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd always try and, and do it. Generally, when, when the festival was on for Cheltenham, I was usually away in tournaments abroad. I mean, I used to be, they had a tournament in Thailand right in the middle of the Cheltenham Festival <laughs> every year. So I used to have Adrian Humphreys for the Sport and Life faxing me the results straight through to a hotel <laughs> in Thailand. So I, I never really got it. So when, when obviously Aintree was on and there wasn't a tournament there, I was always going to go. So without giving the, the name of the next horse away, were you there in 1993? Was I there? This is one of the best horse races I have ever seen in my life. And it's 1993. It won Ride of the Year and it should have won Ride of the Decade. This is one of my... If I had 
five or six races to watch for the rest of my life, this would be one of them. Flown from ruling, Morley Street coming there on the near side, Granville again on the far side. Flown now being tackled by Morley Street, who's been ridden very patiently by Graham Bradley. Flown lands from Morley Street second. Morley Street has won here at Liverpool for the last four years. Is he going to make it five on National Day? Flown from Morley Street, travelling well on his outside. Then his brother Granville again in third over the final flight. Flown a magnificent jump, but Morley Street has come to tackle him. Granville again comes next and then ruling. They're racing into the closing stages. Flown under pressure. Morley Street on the near side. Granville again coming to tackle them. It's the two brothers now. Morley Street sprints clear from Granville again. Morley Street has won it. Granville again is second. Flown third and four ruling. And so the two brothers, the two famous brothers, finish one, two. Well, the first thing to say, uh, John, is that with that link that you just did into Morley Street, I think you've got a future in broadcasting. I'm just going to put it out there. But I'm going to let you go through what made this race special for you? I mean, anybody who remembers that time remembers the ride, but I think we all might have felt it in a different way. You, you explain your feelings. Well, it was, it was just a, brill a brilliant horse um, trained by Toby Bolden, wonderful chestnut, lo lovely jumper. Um, and of course, in 93, he'd won a champion hurdle in 91, despite the fact he, he didn't really like Cheltenham. Um, and he turned up in 93 and... He basically had two poor runs. He'd finished last to five behind Moldboard, never picked his feet up. And then he'd gone to Cheltenham and he turned into the straight going well enough and thought, oh, we don't fancy this hill. And he'd basically just not run up and finished beating 15 lengths by his brother Granville again. Time form actually gave him a squiggle, yeah. which was probably what he had to, you know, he had his own mind about the game at that time. Um, I, I, and it was just a matter of, you know, if, he was, if his head was right, everything was right for that day. Of course, he was ridden by a good pal of mine, Graham Bradley, who has had his old misdemeanors over the years, but you can't take it away. What a fabulous, fabulous jockey he was that day. And he was full of confidence the horse was going to run well. Um, and I actually couldn't sleep the night before, I have to be honest with you, because I looked at the, at the, at the, you know, the price in the, in the paper, the Liverpool Echo, the night before, and he was like a 7-1 to one shot. And I thought, two and a half mile, flat track, perfect ground, flown, can only run one way, which is out in front. He's going to tee the race up for him because he wanted a fast pace. And I was the first one in the betting shop in my village the next morning. And he must have looked at me and thought, oh, you must fancy something. And I thought seven to one was manna from heaven. And I had to went in, I backed him. I thought, the only thing I'm backing here is if his head's right. Because if he's on a going day, he will pick these up and carry them. And needless to say, that's what happened. I actually pressed up later on and had more on. which was, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a monster gambler by a long stretch. But I looked at it and I thought, this is manna from heaven. How can they be making this seven to one? And of course, Graham gave him the peach of a ride. It was voted Ride of the Year in 93 by his peers at the awards that year. And what a ride. To have the confidence and the cheek to hold on for him from so long when you're obviously pulling treble over everything was just one of my favourite rides ever. And he was a class, class jockey. And there was something satisfying about the fact that Morley Street was a great champion. He was a top, top class horse, winning on the, obviously very good on the flat, uh, winning the Breeders' Cup chases in America and stuff like that. But leading into that particular Aintree Hurdle in 93 on that day, uh, you mentioned the time form squiggle. One or two people had said, career in decline, he's, he's, go he's going at the game if he's not already gone. So I guess that satisfaction for any, anyone in sport is even more so. Yeah, and, and, and you're back to the same thing. Listen, as we all get older, you see, there's certain things we don't like doing, and, and horses are no different. And Morley Street just didn't like Cheltenham, full stop. And it, apparently, the rumour is he had a gallop at home with Forrest Sun before he went there for Aintree. And Forrest Sun was a good horse in his own right, one at the festival. I think he won the Supreme, didn't he, Forrest Sun? So he was a good horse. He'd had a gallop at home, and Morley Street had run all over him, which is fair enough. You know, he's a better horse. But he'd given him three stone in the gallop. I mean, it, that, it, you've got to have some sort of engine to be doing that. And it was just a matter of whether his head was right. And of course, coming back to his, his stomping ground, all the conditions right for him. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful day. And it was, obviously, it's, it's, it's made better by the fact you've had a few quid on. Mm. That, that, that goes without saying. But it was just the fact that it was redemption for the old fella because he was getting much maligned. And, and when he was at his best, he was seriously better than anything in that race. It was a pretty dramatic day to be at Aintree that day, wasn't it? Yeah, I should say so. It was indeed. We didn't know what was following after that, but um, 
it, it, to be honest with you, it, I, I, I've almost forgotten about Audi just because I've, I've remembered this race so much and, and looking back and watching it again, and I've forgotten how good it was that, um, to be honest with you, whatever happened that day, I'll <laughs> just always remember Morley Street. Once your pocket's full of all the cash after you'd pressed up, it doesn't matter about Avoid National or anything like that, I guess. No, no, absolutely, and it, and it's not it's not just much. It's just being right. I mean, that's why that's why we all punt, isn't it? We all and we and we're all like to think we're clever, and if we all get it right on the day, I mean, listen, we all back hundreds of losers, but when you get it absolutely right and you feel vindicated by yourself and and for the horse itself, it's uh, it's very satisfying. I mentioned in Morley Street's career, he did some some remarkable things, uh, especially the fact that he ran over fences in America before he even ran over fences or attempted to go over fences here when he went for the, the, the Breeders' Cup steeplechase, as they called it in Maryland. Yeah, he won twice over there. I mean, listen, you know, he's, he was a pioneer really in the days of that because, you know, the, the, the travelling all around the world wasn't a, a, as prominent as it is now. I mean, it's, it's nothing for these people to take the horses everywhere and run. So he went over there and beat the best they had to offer. And let's not forget, by the way, on the flat, he was a very good staying horse on the flat. He was rated, he was rated in excess of 100. I think his highest rating was 103. So he was very capable on the flat as well. He was just a brilliant all-round versatile horse. But there was just something about him. And he, and he, he just had a massive engine and a wonderful way of travelling. And uh, that race that Brad rode on him was just outstanding. Would uh, Graham Bradley be in your list of uh, most talented jockeys? Or how high would he be in your list of most talented jockeys you've seen over jumps yeah absolutely definitely be in my top 10 that's for certain um and particularly brilliant i mean listen uh, uh, novice chases he was fantastic novice chase and and chases in general but listen people always remember him for the chases but what about that hurdle ride he gave that mm. absolutely outstanding and he, and he knew he knew pace he knew everything about it. he was a proper jockey brad and uh, I, I still i can still see him to this day <laughs> making a shape over a fence and um he, he was, if you come into contact with Graham and you didn't like him, then there was something wrong with you. Were you at Aintree in the spring of 1995, John? I might have been. <laughs> uh, well, if he was, he would have enjoyed another magnificent contest, this time in the Melling Chase. Uh, some of the smartest horses we've ever seen over two miles locking horns. Coming down to the final ditch now, South Hilton, the leader from Viking flagship and Martha's son at the last ditch. And it's South Hilton and Martha's son with between horses, Viking flagship, deep sensation making ground over on the far side. Viking flagship takes a fractional lead, but here comes Martha's son on the near side. Four of them in contention at the final fence. Martha's son takes a fractional advantage, it's just how they jump the last. Martha's son lands in the lead from Viking flagship. Deep sensation getting up over on the far side. Deep sensation and Martha's son and Viking flagship as they come to the line. It's a photo finish between Viking flagship and deep sensation. The photo between Viking flagship and deep sensation. Adrian Maguire thinks he's just got up in the closing stages. A wonderful race, wonderful finish. Uh, and I know a lot of jockeys, other jockeys, the likes of Charlie Swan and A.P. McCoy, Richard Dunwoody, they were all associated at one point or another with Viking flagship. But Adrian Maguire and Viking flagship were a match made in heaven. Is that how you saw it? Very much so. I mean, he was just absolutely tailor-made for him. I mean, he could just galvanise him. He was a, it, there won't be many people, I don't think, doing your series who will pick a horse who hasn't won in his first 18 runs, Rishi. But this, this horse didn't win in his first 18 runs on a race course, which is incredible. He was trained in Ireland. He couldn't get his head in front. Uh, and then they sent him over to the genius that is Martin Pipe, who could win with the rusty pram. And, of course, he got four races out of him. And then the horse went to the sales and went, ended up with David Nicholson. And it's a typical second season. Novice found it difficult in the handicap hurdles. He was only rated 131 at the end of his of his hurdles career there. But um, they thought obviously chasing's going to be his game. And the funny thing is, he fell on his first chase and then won his next six. But it's between 1993 and 96 where he just improved massively. I mean, he improved 42 pound over jumps, three stone. I mean, incredible. And uh, of course, you've just seen that race there in 95. And, and you've never had a truer, hardier warrior in your corner when you had, if you it was a punter's dream. If you had a bet, you just knew you were getting absolutely everything. And if he got beat, it was because he was beaten by a better horse on the day, but it wasn't because he didn't try. Um, and he was, a, he, was a, he was one of my, I, I love horses like that. Horses who are just so reliable and you just know they're gonna give everything. There was that moment where Noel Williamson, your colleague on 
uh, the BBC for a spell, gets a dream run on Deep Sensation. And you think Deep Sensation, who was obviously behind Viking Flagship at Cheltenham, might get his revenge. Yeah, absolutely. He was a wonderful horse. He was very athletic chestnut. He could travel through any pace you wanted to throw. And it's worth remembering, by the way, that the monster that was on his other side, which is Martha's mm. son, when he was right, he probably was the most talented of his era. He just had plenty of niggles. It was, he was never really... There was one year he, he was there and he, he was up against the best of them and he, he beat them pointless. But um, uh, on the, uh, for, you'd look at Viking flags and you'd think, hmm, is he travelling? Hmm, not particularly. Is he jumping? He's jumping all right. I mean, you'd, you'd look at him there and you think, well, he's going the least best of the three. But it's that will to win and the tenacity in a finish that marked him down. I mean, he won, you know, he won a Tingle Creek, he won a Holden Gold Cup, he won two Game Spirits, two Melon Chasers, and two Champion Chasers. I mean, he just, he, he apparently was incredibly difficult to get fit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I read a report saying he's one of the hardest horses they ever had to get fit. But when he was, he was as tough as Teak, and you could see that in the finish and, and in his attitude. He, you, you mentioned will to win. He never stopped trying. And that's why, I guess, when you're talking about the combination of Adrian Maguire, who was a sort of never say die, he yeah. would never give up. He would always, if you had backed a horse that was ridden by Adrian Maguire, you always felt you had a chance regardless. And allied to Adrian Maguire was a horse who had the same sort of spirit. Yeah, and you're absolutely right, and he did. And then there was a couple of years, I think it was maybe next year or the year after, AP got to ride him, and it was only a four-runner race that year, but some very good horses in, I think, Sam Mann and Claron Davis and the likes. And AP got to ride him, and I thought, well, if there's another marriage made in heaven, <laughs> two absolutely driven champions together. So uh, that must have been difficult to beat them, and he didn't. He absolutely jumped them ragged. Is there a, a joy watching... Uh, two mile chasers, the very best two mile chasers going at it for you, or do you get i mean I guess you can get as much pleasure in all sorts, but what which is the which is the one that's that's most pure the one that excites you most what what uh, particular category well i'm going to come to one of them a little bit later i I actually have to say my favorite horse race of the entire calendar is the champion hurdle, and it's always been the champion hurdle. I love hurdlers who who jump at speed and, as I say, flick over the top bar and quicken away from hurdles. And I love the pure speed of doing that. But the two-mile chases, over chases, definitely would be the, the championship two miles uh, would be my, my preference. I mean, listen, don't, don't get me wrong. Who doesn't love a Gold Cup or a Grand National? But when, when it's the speed involved and having to get all those fences right and the hurdles right at speed, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's what I like the most. He is very good at broadcasting, isn't he, John Parrott? Because he's now giving me the perfect link into our next horse. And we go back to Cheltenham, 1998. Champion Hurdle Day. And the champion is to Brackers. Uh, surely uh, for him now he's gone too clear of I am supposing. But Shadow Leader, who shows such a devastating turn of foot the outside, is in third place. Here we are, two out. It is to Brack, clear by two to I am supposing Shadow Leader. And then comes Pridwell. And these four are about eight lengths clear of the next tier to World Category. Bellator staying on, but it looks to be all over as Ister Brack makes the final turn in the Smurfit Champion Hurdle. And Irish eyes are smiling for JP McManus. Unbeaten this season, Mr. Brack takes the last final hurdles and is cleared by 10 to 12 lengths. A fall at the final flight with Shadow Leader. It brought down Bellator, uh, but they're toiling in the wake as they race up towards the line because the champion hurdle this year, the Smurfit champion hurdle, goes to the Irish on St. Patrick's Day. It's Mr. Brack and Charlie Swan who win. It's going to be an Irish 1 2 because Theatre World comes through for second out of Asian third. Well, in an earlier race, we saw Morley Street and Granville again, two very, very good hurdlers, outstanding hurdlers. But, JP, would Mr. Brack be the best you've seen? Yeah, I think so. I think um, his combination, uh, combination of being able to travel through a race, jump his hurdles well, and then quicken away. I mean, you saw on that bit of footage there that, that Charlie Swan used to ride him brilliantly, but Charlie Swan was brilliant, so that's why he did it. But when, when he, come, he used to come in the straight, he used to quicken at the bottom in the turn, and go three or four lengths up, and then he knew his stamina was going to was going to kick in because, as a as a novice, he, did, he didn't run in the Supreme. He stepped him up to the two mile five race, and he won that you know reasonably impressively. But it wasn't until he dropped him back to two mile that you saw him at his best. The thing about Isterbrack as well was that he was always prepped with such confidence by Aidan O'Brien, and you always felt that he would only peak come Cheltenham. Yet he still put together that invincible record over such a long period of time. 
Yeah, but well, he won 23 races out of his 29. He was second three times, and the only other times he, he, he ran, he, he fell twice, and he was pulled up, obviously, in the last race at Cheltenham, and he was obviously wrong, but he was a, a phenomenal hardy. Uh, listen, I went to a meeting midweek at a Haydock in 96 in June, and Richard Hills rode a horse called Isterbrach in a one mile six nought to 90 handicap, and I backed him, and he got beat. He got beat by a horse called Tegenev, and I came out of the track, and I did not know what was to follow. I mean, he went to the sales bought by Timmy Hyde, I think, for about 38 grand or something, and he went to, to J.P. McManus, and uh, I don't think any horse will ever give J.P. as much pleasure as that fella, because he was just hardy, tough, travelled, jumped, uh, game, never once cocked his jaw or flashed his tail in any of the conditions he ran at, and um, he was just an absolute credit to the, to the connections. Yeah, the only time I backed him in his entire career was when he got beaten by Fujiyama Crest. Don't say Pridwell. <laughs> no, oh, no right. but by Fujiyama Crest at Ascot uh, in September of, of 95. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I, I never backed him again, yeah. so I didn't do very well, but he was a magnificent no. horse. But the occasion of the 1998 champion hurdle was quite a poignant one. Uh, how aware of you were you at the time of uh, what had happened with John Durkin, uh, yeah. leukemia, Absolutely. Uh, and how much this horse meant to yeah. the success. Yeah, uh, very much so. As I say, the horse was bought by Timmy Hyde. He was supposed to go into training with John Durkin, who sadly got leukaemia, and, and he never recovered, and the horse ended up being sent to Aidan O'Brien. But I'm sure all the connections felt for him, and uh, it was a very poignant victory. Um, I actually had a message given for the beforehand, and uh, a professional punter who I'd done a little turn for, I'd given a winner somewhere, said, I'll, give you, uh, I'll, I'll do the turn. He said, I've been told this is defeat impossible. I said, he's a four to one shot. He said, it's defeat impossible, I've been told. He said, I said, it was the last time he went off a three to one. It was the last time you ever saw a three to one for Istabra. I think I remember or, uh, the interview with uh, Leslie Graham that Charlie Swan did on course after the race, just as they crossed the line. The only thing he could get, the only thing he'd say before he, he started crying and became emotional was that uh, before the race, Aidan O'Brien told him that Isterbrack would destroy them. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, I didn't hear that much. I just, I just, I just heard the, the line of defeat impossible. And, and it was the way and the manner in which he did it. And um, he wasn't, he wasn't um, particularly punter friendly after that day. I mean, there was always odds on when he won, but he never had any trouble. The next two uh, champion hurdles he won, he won doing handsprings, so he was, he was just miles ahead of the opposition and uh, as I say, little did I know what I was watching at Haydock that afternoon. <laughs> uh, was there, has there ever been another hurdler, do you think, that has come to his level in, in, in your time or in recent years perhaps? Um, it's difficult to say, to be honest with you. Uh, there's some, been, some cracking ones over the years and uh, some very good, good hurdlers. I mean, I, I don't really know how good CU then was, but Nicky Henderson did a brilliant job to get three, three wins out of him. Um, there's been some speci special hurdlers over the years, but there's none really had his longevity where they've gone back and won as many hurdle races and kept going and, as I say, never cocked his jaw and never flashed his tail. Mm. Uh, what, what, what about Aidan O'Brien at the time? If someone had said to you that he was going to take over the world uh, in, in flat racing in particular, uh, although he'd done brilliantly with, with Isterbrack and he'd just be, began to make yeah. waves in, in the flat racing scene, it's been the most phenomenal progress since then. Unbelievable. Uh, as I say, the, we, we had no idea how good the horse was going to be, but we certainly had no idea how good the trainer was. And... Um, it doesn't matter what he's given from, you know, the sprinters all the way up to the to the staying horses. I mean, you know, I was asked at the day that Yates won his fourth Gold Cup there. I mean, just absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal trainer of a racehorse. And um, it, it, I think when he was appointed, it was the shrewdest move they've ever made. OK, well, uh, I know John is a person who loves a little bit of uh, trivia now and then, John, I'd say. Now, Easter Brack fell twice, only twice in his career. Which horse benefited uh, from both those falls. One horse benefited twice. Hmm. Okay, hold it. I don't know. I'll have a guess. Limestone lad? No, no. It's not Limestone lad. Ooh. In fact, John, it's the next horse that John has chosen for his list of My Racing Life 7. It's this fella, ridden by Barry Geraghty. They head towards the third last, the pond fence. Moscow flies in front, but is he a sitting duck? Barry Geraghty looks around. He sees Ruby Walsh with plenty of horse under him. Well, Chiefs behind these, then Chenkos on the outside. At 
the third last. Moscow Flyer about a length to a 30 of his second place. And now the race is on as they turn for home. Garrity looks round again, almost with nonchalance there. A 30 of now being driven. Well, Chief is third. At the second last, Moscow Flyer from a 30 of. Then Well, Chief in third trying to reel them back. Moscow Flyer's got them on the stretch as they run down to the last. Moscow Flyer chased by a 30 of. And Well, Chief at the final fence. Moscow Flyer. Chief, though, is bridging the gap in second, the young horse. In third is a dirty off. Up the hill, can the old boy hold on? It's Moscow Fly, chased by World Chief and a dirty off. And Moscow Fly wins the Tingle Creek for the second year running. Tight for second, World Chief and a dirty off. A long break then to Chenkov and upgrade. For about four and a half, five years, uh, this horse, Moscow Flyer, was almost invincible. How good was he that day in the Tingle Creek against Azerti up and Well Chief? Do you know I couldn't sleep the night before that race? I actually couldn't sleep. I was, I was so excited about seeing three great champions taking each other on. And I can remember sitting in, in my little village and having a breakfast in the morning and wishing the hours away till the start of that race because I just could not wait to see it. And they were all great champions. Uh, Graham Bradley had bought Well Chief. He'd been brilliant for David Johnson and Martin Pipe. Azertiop was the champion chaser uh, in a race that Moscow Flyer had unseated his rider. And then, of course, you know, all connections thought they were good enough to win. Barry Geraghty was exuding confidence. And in the morning of the race, Moscow Flyer wasn't favourite. I mean, he was, he was, I think he was with Well Chief. I think Azertiop was favourite. It wasn't until just before the off that I think the whole of Ireland decided to lump on and he was there, he was turned into the favourites but it, it's one of my favourite races of all time and if I could have been anywhere and wished myself I'd love to have been to Sand at Sandown that day because the atmosphere was incredible and that was one of the best Tingle Creeks you'd ever be likely to see. It's interesting when you look back at the Viking flagship race there was Martha's son and Deep Sensation making it a great race you touched on Well Chief and Azertiop helping to make Moscow Flyers race a great race and so much of Moscow Flyers career he took on such good horses such top class horses whether it be uh, Flagship Uberalis uh, winner of the Queen Mother Azerti at Well Chief they're all really really outstanding horses so if we're going to compare top class two mile chasers and I know Sprinter Sack would be the obvious other one where would, would Moscow Flyer be the number one? Well he'd definitely be in your top three wouldn't he? Um, if you said to you know, if you said you had a pick of any of them you'd like, he'd do for me. I mean, I, I obviously we didn't see as much a race in an island as, as we do now. It's brilliant with the, what you cover on the channel and everything. So we, it wasn't until he came over for the Arkell in 2002 we saw him first time over a fence. And uh, I know that Robbie Fowler and Steve McManaman fancied Seaball for the life in that, yes. in that particular <laughs> Arkell, but he was miles clear of the third horse, but he couldn't cope with Moscow Flyer. And, and of course, he won two champion chases and and two Tingle Creeks, including that, which was my favourite race. But there was a spell in the middle of his form reach where he had 24 runs, and he actually unseated and, and fell four times in that. But the other 20 times he stood up, he won. And that's some sequence against the best horses in Ireland and Britain. Uh, what was it about Moscow in his races that excited you, or you felt characterised uh, his superiority over other horses? Well, he was a proper specimen to say that, you know, and it, and it was the way he galloped over the over the ground, and when he got his jumps right, he was a it was a pretty good jumper. To, to you know, that goes as an understatement. But it was just his exuberance and his mm. style of racing, and then, you know, he was tough when he had to be tough, and you saw it in that single creek. You're not going to win that unless you've got a, a a bit of toughness about you. He was brilliant, travelled well, jumped well, and then he just had a great turn of foot. He was just superbly ridden, and Barry Geraghty, as I say, he was full of confidence in his ability and. Uh, it was then sort of then you realised that, that Jessica Harrington was a fabulous trainer as well and so it proved over the years with all the, the big races she's won. So it, he was, she was a credit to his yard. It's interesting when you hear Barry Geraghty talk about both horses, he never says, and it's obviously in, in public, he never says Moscow or, or Sprinter. I, I, I've never heard him say it whatsoever, but I, I'd love one day to find out if Moscow turned up at his absolute best and Sprinter turned up at his absolute best which one Barry would, would ride, you think Moscow? I don't know. It's very difficult. And, and if he's not comparing them, he knows far more than I do, so I'm not <laughs> going to do it. But all I can say to you is you wouldn't be able to buy, you wouldn't be able to buy a ticket to get in if it was racing. You wouldn't get one. Uh, you mentioned Sandown, obviously a, another tremendous venue. How much, how much racing around the country have you done through, through your career uh, as, a, as a racing fan? Um, plenty. Plenty. 
I've uh, I've got six courses left to do out of the fifty nine or sixty whatever it is now, and um, I'm I'm trying to tick a couple of them off. I've, I've I've, I've not amazingly I've been to where and spoken at a dinner but I've never actually been to the races that are there <laughs> I've got Market Rays in Yarmouth Fontwell um, Chelmsford City and another one somewhere but that, that, that's about it to, 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 to tick the yeah. list off so oh, I don't uh, I don't just wa- you know just watch in my house um, certainly in the last few years when I've had more time I, I love to go there's nothing like it uh, and which would be the ones that you, I mean, Sandown, I think, Tingle Creek Day, there are few occasions in sport that can actually match Sandown on Tingle It's fantastic. Uh, that time of the year, the, the type of race that it is as well. Um, which would be the ones, obviously Cheltenham is an obvious one, an entry that we've already talked about. Which would be the, the, the hidden gems, do you think, of the ones that you've been to that, that may surprise one or two people? Uh, I think Perth is absolutely lovely. I think that's a wonderful day out going to Perth. It's set in the beautiful woods next to Scone or Scone Palace, whichever way you want your pronunciation. Um, that's a lo- that's a lovely, lovely track up there, up north. Um, but I'm I'm just as I'm equally as happy going to Sandown and Cheltenham as I am on the top balcony at Ludlow. You know, I think there's a it's a fantastic view up there watching the race in there. And of course, my local track, not you know, not that far. A little bit tricky to get to going back into Liverpool and out, but. A good day's racing at Bangor on D. They haven't even got a stand there, and it's still a fabulous little track where you get good horses riding. You know, the ground's always good, the fences are always well presented. It's a lovely little track, Bangor. And I, I can get as much enjoyment going to Bangor or Sedgefield or Ludlow than I can go into any of them. It's, it's still jump racing after all. Mm. Uh, well, we've seen some great horses already uh, in John's list of uh, his horses in this ep- episode of My Racing Life. From one great chaser, Moscow Flyer, to another who, in 2009, at the Cheltenham Festival, did something that no other horse had done before, or indeed, has done since. This is three out, and they come to it. Quarto Star in the centre. On the left, Denman. On the right, Neptune Collage. Quarto Star has cantered into the lead in the hands of Ruby Walsh. Sam Thomas gets to work on Denman. Then Neptune Collage back in third. Exotic Dancer is back in fourth. They round the final turn. Here's the rematch, but it's a different story 12 months on, and Quarto Star kicks away from Denman. Quarto Star goes four or five lengths clear of Denman. Then Exotic Exotic Dancer over two out, Cordo Star, Demon in second place, Exotic Dancer who's never beaten Cordo Star moves into third, but it's Cordo Star and Ruby Walsh, one last fence to go, he sometimes makes a mistake but not today, Cordo Star, 10 or 12 lengths clear, this is the champion, Cordo Star well clear of Denman, Exotic Dancer back in third, Cordo Star, history being made at Cheltenham, the first horse to regain the Gold Cup, Still by Denman on the comeback trail. Third was Exotic Dancer, Neptune Collange in fourth. Then big run. The first horse to regain the Gold Cup, the only horse, JP, to regain the Gold Cup. A magical day. Yeah, absolutely. I was, on, I was lucky enough to be um, one of the betting firms. I was up in the box there, and I think I was with Alan Brazil, I think, who had a rather lumpy bet on Corto <laughs> Star that day. He was screaming the house down. But the, it was a privilege to be there and to see that happen. And... Um, the roof came off. It was one of those days that you were so glad that you were there watching a little bit of history. But the horse himself was just a phenomenon. I mean, brilliantly trained by Paul Nichols, brilliantly ridden by Ruby Walsh. But it's his versatility, Reese, that just marks him down as something special. I mean, to win two Tingle Creeks over two miles, we mentioned at Sandown, and then to be able to step up and win, you know, four Betfair chases, five King Georges, and to win two Gold Cups over three mile two when you've been a champion of two mile is just ridiculous. I mean, there's, those horses do not come along. Uh, every day of the week and, and I don't think Paul will ever have another one like him. You mentioned uh, his versatility. What about his courage? A lot of people talked about the fact that Denman was all all heart. He just rolled on and on and on. I, I've, I've often felt that maybe Corto never got enough credit through his career for being the type of horse that could also get down and dirty when he had to. When, he, when things weren't going well for him, he could also fight. Absolutely. Look at his role of honour. You don't win those things easy every, sing- every single time that you race. I mean, there's going to be opposition coming along in all those years, new challenges and uh, new, different conditions, different days. You know, you've got to be a hardy racehorse on top of being a very talented one. 
I mean, I'm I'm, I'm going to apologise to Harry Findlay if he's watching this because he's probably swearing at the TV, thinking, "Oh, I haven't put Denman in there." But <laughs> I mean, Denman round Newbury the second time he won the Hennessy mm. with, the, with the weight on his back is the best performance I've ever seen at Newbury. Mm. Uh, full stop. But I just got to put Corto ahead because of the, the amount, you know, the races that he won and the versatility and the talent that he showed, and um, uh, he's just brilliant. I mean, the only other, the only time, the only thing you can ever say about him is that him and Ruby had the odd disagreement at the last <laughs> fence at Kempton, and that's about it because everything else was perfect. Uh, were you? Uh, you mentioned the two thousand and nine Gold Cup. What about the comeback for Corto? Were you were you at either Kempton or perhaps at, at Haydock for the for the fourth Betfair Chase win? No, I wasn't there for that. I was obviously uh, otherwise engaged with something or other. But it was that it was that day, that, as I mentioned, when I was there when he when he won it at, at Cheltenham was just one of the best days. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I say on handful of days going racing, if you could only pick them, that would be one of them when he won because the atmosphere was like nothing else. He was a, he was the people's champion. Everybody wanted him to regain the title, and he didn't disappoint. And um, it was a privilege to see him, and he's certainly the best chaser in my lifetime that I've ever seen. Ruby Walsh. Well, we talked about Adrian Maguire and Viking flagship being in sync. Ruby Walsh, apart from one or two small uh, moments with, with Corto, he seemed to be, he and Corto seemed to be another match that was made. Perhaps it lends itself to the fact that they, they were associated for such a long time. But there was that understanding very early on, it seemed, that Ruby would generally let Corto do his own thing at fences. Because when you compare Corto's jumping to perhaps, say, a wayward lad, Wayward Lad was precise, safe all the time. Corto, perhaps flashy? Yeah, very much so. I mean, Kate, you know, made the occasional mistake. They all, they all do. They go into over a period of time. But um, if you had, there were certain jockeys that you'd want to ride for you for the rest of your life and you couldn't have anybody else. I think Ruby Walsh should be the top of most people's lists. I mean, you've had brilliant jockeys over the years in AP and Ruby Walsh and Charlie Swan, who I mentioned, and Richard Dunwoody and Maguire and Graham Bradley. All these jockeys are fantastic over the years, but... Riding around Cheltenham um, and riding on those big tracks and riding the big occasions, I think most people would um, be plumping for Ruby um, if it wasn't AP. Um, so he was a fabulous jockey, suited to the horse, knew exactly what he was going to do on him, uh, knew what the horse was capable of, had a brilliant clock in his head, Ruby. I mean, you think about all the times and all those races at Cheltenham. Have you ever seen him in the wrong place at Cheltenham mm. when he rode? He was always in the right places with horses travelling through his hands, always presented I mean, you know, much is made about the fact that he fell off at the last hurdle on Annie Power for the, which would have cost the bookmakers upwards of 20 million. But, you know, one blip aside, anyone can fall at the last hurdle. The, you look at all the rides he gave horses around there, and there wasn't many people better than him. Yeah, I think that's the thing about him. 99.9% .9 of the times he was in the right place, doing the right thing, getting the best results on the, on the days uh, that mattered most. Uh, and a horse who perhaps is a, a horse that certainly gave his absolute best, uh, both on uh, the flat and over jumps uh, was a horse trained by Donald McCain and we're going to look back at one of his biggest successes on the flat at Chester. Out wide, Mount Athos has taken off into midfield, but it's still Overturn who leads from Taster Hill, and Overturn is kicking again, top of the straight, furlong and a half to go. Overturn by four lengths from Taster Hill, in behind these Darley Sun in third, then Mystery Star, the nosepan from Red Caddo, down the outside, Mount Athos, Overturn with 200 yards to cover, Taster Hill is still chasing gamely, then Mystery Star, Overturn in front, is clinging on grimly, Overturn not for catching, when the chips are down, Rel Ryan McCain and Overturn wins the Chester Cup. Still love the commentary as much as anything else. Uh, when the chips, is da chips are down, rely yeah. on McCain, rely on Overturn. He just was wonderfully enthusiastic, wasn't he? He was just a lovely, lovely bonny horse. He was trained on the flat by, by Walter Swinburne. He got picked up to go to Donald's and... Uh, he was uh, owned by Tim Leslie uh, in those famous colours. And I, I actually, my next door neighbour is a good pal of Tim's and he invited him around for dinner one night and he said, would you like to come, come for dinner and meet him? And I, it took me at least five minutes to tell him that I loved Overturn and he was my favourite horse in training uh, and chewed his ear off for the night. But I absolutely, from the first time I saw him and I saw his attitude, I, I just absolutely fell in love with him. I just thought he was wonderfully enthusiastic. He used to run the same way all the time, bounce out in front and give absolutely everything that he's got. And um, from 2010 to 2013, when his final race was, I don't think anybody as an owner could have had more fun. I think, you know, as I say, dual purpose, the races he won and the way he rode, 
uh, every time with his heart on his sleeve. Um, he was just a phenomenal horse that, personally, he'd have been my type to own. If I could have owned anything in the last few years, it would have been him. He'd have taken you to some uh, great moments and great occasions. Uh, obviously, the Chester Cup was, was one of the great ones where he, he came out on top. But he also ran some magnificent races in defeat, including uh, at Cheltenham in the Champion Hurdle. Yeah, he was second behind Ru um, Rock on Ruby. He's only beaten a length and a half there. That binocular and Hurricane Fly was behind. But listen to this. In 2010, Rishi, he won a Scottish Champion Hurdle. He won the Northumberland Derby on the flat. Um, he, Northumberland Plate, the Pittman's Derby on the flat. Uh, he went to Galway, uh, took on the Irish, carried 11 stone eight in the Galway hurdle, one of the most competitive hurdles of the year, where there's usually more plots than an Agatha Christie box set. <laughs> and he managed to carry 11 eight and beat them pointless. He came home, he went to Ascot hurdle down south, won that. Uh, then the Chester Cup that you've seen. Um, and then he won the fight in fifth, and he's actually the only horse at Newcastle, in Newcastle's history to win both the Pittman's Derby on the flat and the fight in fifth. And he beat Binocular that day when he won, but he was second again the following year with top weight in the Chester Cup, mm -hmm. beaten by a handicap loss, well clear of the third. Uh, second in a Christmas hurdle. And then he went novice chasing, and he won three novice chases on the spin, and he ended up in a grade one novice at Aintree in his very last run. And he was second, beating a length and three quarters by Special Tiara, who <laughs> went on to be a champion chaser. So what a versatile horse. From running a flat race over seven furlongs, uh, he, took his he took his trainer and his owner to places that he could only dream of. And I, I spoke to Tim that night and I said to him, look, I said, you, you've ruined racing for yourself because you'll never have another one like him. <laughs> and trained by someone who obviously you mentioned going a lot to Banger, uh, a, a race course that Donald McCain has done very well. Uh, did you know Donald at all? Did you get to know him through the over 10 years? Yeah, well, I, I, we did a piece, if we remember, for one year for BBC. He, had, he was training one of the prominent horses for the Grand National. And I was very fortunate to, to be invited to his yard and was made a cup of tea and then went out on the gallops. And to me, that's just heaven going out watching horses gallop in the morning with the, the breath and the coming up the hill. You know, and if you, if you come up Donald's Hill three times and, and you're not blowing, you're pretty fit, let me tell you, because it's a good old test there. Um, but he's a, he's a lovely, he's a very unassuming, lovely man, Donald. And uh, he's had some really good horses in his time there. Cinders and Ashes was a, was a, mm. a brilliant winner, the supreme novice. And of course, Peddler's Cross, who was fantastic up until... Poor old Hurricane Fly broke his heart in that champion hurdle that year, but he's had some great horses through his hands, obviously winners of nationals and the rest of it. But um, he's, he's my favourite horse he's had in the yard, and uh, I absolutely loved every bit of Overtime when he ran. And uh, uh, I don't know what happened to him in the end. I don't know, quite know after 2013 why he didn't run again, but he was a, an absolute fabulous superstar for that yard. In your list of seven, John, there's a, a theme about horses with, with courage, uh, wear their heart on their sleeve, horses that just put it all out there, consistent as well. Uh, do you, sometimes people say they, they recognise uh, characteristics of themselves and the horses that they support. I tend to support the horses that are slightly burly and uh, perhaps save a little bit for themselves. Uh, do, you, what have, do you feel that, that that applies to you and your, your selection? Uh, I, I am. I've been known to be a little bit competitive, so it's. Uh, it's. It's. <laughs> I, I do. Like, I just like horses that are straightforward and honest and try because I think you've got a chance with all of them. It, the flashy ones at home that work everything, you know, work the house down at home and don't put it on the on a race course are not for me. You need to sell that to somebody else. I just want something that's going to stick its head down, give me everything it's got every time it runs, and be as honest as the day's long and. The ones I've picked are extremely talented, but they've all got, you know, they've all got that when they get their optimal conditions. I mean, obviously, Morley Street near the end went a little bit funny, but um, when, when they're at the best and, and they've got the conditions that they like and they're, they're prepared to battle it out for me, your Viking flag trips and your overturns and all these horses that are going to stick their head down and go run right the way to the line for you, they're the type that I want to be with. And we mentioned a lot of great characters in the game, great names, jockeys uh, and trainers over the years. Who, who would be the ones that... You know, growing up or indeed at any point that you would say yeah I would want so-and-so to ride for me for my life I would so-and-so to train for me for for my life pretty diff it's it's pretty easy for me to do I mean I've mentioned I think you know Ruby was as good as anyone riding but if I wanted somebody in the play for me for my life I'd want AP McCoy and if I wanted anyone to train for me I'd want MC Pipe um in the you know when I was going sort of mid 80s and he started I was actually there the day that Peter Scudamore rode Hieronymus the first time he'd ever ride for Martin Pipe won a, a Haydock novice hurdle and Peter Scudamore got off and said this is the fittest horse I've ever ridden and um, he was just ahead of his time his, his horses were incredibly fit 
they were brilliantly placed. Um, you know, you have to remember in those days, quite a few trainers were sort of two runs and then they're fit and ready to go. You, you can't do that now. It's just there's too many good trainers about, too many people know what they're doing. And Martin was ahead of his time, his placements and his, his runs. Of, I can remember Cat's Eyes being bought out of a cellar for four grand, I think it was, and his, his dad bought it for him and ended up like romping through all the handicaps. And he won a handicap at Liverpool, a competitive one with nine ten on his back. Paul Leach in the saddle so he, he could he could turn horses inside out and get the absolute best out of them and of course Unsinkable Boxer would probably be the easiest, easiest winner you've ever seen at a Cheltenham Festival Did you back on un, un, Unsinkable Boxer? What do you think? Of course I did, did. I'm sure you did I'm sure you did uh, JP we've spoken a lot about racing uh, obviously we're keeping our fingers crossed that 1st of June it all comes back I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the, the world of snooker uh, and what's happening? Obviously, there's there's been uh, plans, it seems, for for the World Championship to be held at the Crucible in the summer. Yeah, um, we should have had on the dates that we got, we should have had a World Seniors Championship, which I'm involved with, and that should have been our date. So they've basically taken those, and the seniors will be pushed back um, a few days after the championship finishes. But the idea is for it to go ahead. They've got the theatre booked. Whether there'll be uh, crowds in there at the time, we don't know. Whether we'll be actually on site to do from there or in London, we still don't know yet. So there's a few things up in the air. We just hope that everything sort of slowly but surely gets back to normal and we can all go and do what we do, which is enjoy going to a race meeting or going to a snooker tournament mm. or playing golf and going to watch your football team. So it's just a matter of waiting and seeing at the moment. And hopefully this dreaded disease goes away and we can all get back to normal. Well, you often... Uh, over the years has, have been one of the most positive people. You generally have a positive uh, attitude. So how have you coped with the last, the last couple of months? It's fine. And uh, listen, it's nice. I've got my two children back at home with me, Josh and Elliot, back um, from working in London. They've been here all of So we've had, we've had lots of laughs. We've been playing quiz games and chipping in the garden and keeping ourselves occupied. And um, now, obviously, it's, it's just been lifted. So my wife and I are going out to play a bit of golf, and you just got to cope with it. I mean, it's it's there's lots of people in worse situations than we're in. We're just basically sitting here doing what we're supposed to and killing time, and um, hopefully it'll all turn around and we'll be back out and doing what we do. Well, John, I have to say it's been a very enjoyable way to kill some time uh, this afternoon in your company. I've loved. Uh, first of all, seeing you, chatting to you, that's been brilliant, but also going back over those horses and uh, reliving some of the great memories of uh, some great horses as well. I hope you stay safe, hope your family stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you very soon. It's been a pleasure, and you too, Paul. And that was John Parrott on this episode of My Racing Life. It was truly entertaining and a lot of fun from a, a man who has been uh, a lifelong racing fan. Hope you've enjoyed it and look forward to seeing you once again on Racing TV very shortly. Bye-bye. Love to stay up to date with all the latest racing action. Do you want exclusive access to breaking news and competitions? Are you looking to connect with fellow racing fans? Look no further. Our social media channels feature everything you love about racing TV and more right at your fingertips. Stay ahead of the game even when you're on the move with breaking news, fast results and racing replays. Available on our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube channels. With regular social media competitions, polls and discussions, you can connect with thousands of like-minded community members every single day. Stay in the know with 24-7 updates. Available on your laptop, smartphone or tablet. There's always something happening on the Racing TV social media channels. So follow us today. At Racing TV, 100% of our profits go back into racing. Thank you for supporting the sport that we all know and love.